Welcome back to Guide to the Global Economy. I'm Josh Lipsky, Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center. And thanks for joining us for our first Guide to the Global Economy of the Year. We're happy to have you all back here as we explore all the dynamics going inside the US, European, Chinese, Indian, Japanese, German economy throughout the year. We'll track it with you. We appreciate your feedback as we go through this process. Today, we're gonna to talk about US versus EU manufacturing numbers. Those are surprising data to show you. We're also gonna take a look at Bangladesh's election and what it means not just for Bangladesh, but the entire region and where US interests fall coming out of that election. So I wanna welcome in Sophia Bush, Assistant Director at the Geoeconomic Center, Managing Editor of Guide to the Global Economy. Sophia, welcome back. Our first guide recording of the year. For the lead, we wanted to focus on India's economy, India's economic strength, well known, but we want to go inside those numbers. Yeah, so it's Davos week, as many of our viewers might know. Um, and India has a very large presence there looking for investment um, with, you know, they've self-proclaimed themselves as the voice of the global south. It was a big part of their G20 last mm -hmm. year saying those lines. That's right. Yeah. And so... And Kristalina Gorgieva, managing director of the IMF, called India a bright spot in the mm -hmm. global economy. Um, so everyone knows that, but we wanted to look inside the domestic economy a little bit more. So what we did was look at the top 10% of India's um, population um, and specifically looking at um, how much of the total national income this top 10% makes up. So let's take a look at the numbers. Mm -hmm. So here we go. And walk us through India's top 10% in terms of income versus some of the other countries we looked at. Right. So when you see we've got Spain, South Korea, Australia, and Italy, the bars here represent GDPs for these countries in 2022. Um, but India's bar represents um, the income, uh, the share of the total national income that its top 10 wealthiest individuals make up. I see. So that's an important distinction. Mm -hmm. We're looking at GDPs of some advanced economies, right. South Korea, Australia, Spain, as you said, mm -hmm. and then top 10 percent India's income. But it helps give you a sense of the total amount of money that either the entire country is looking at or a subset of the country. Yeah. So this dark blue bar for India, this is one point nine trillion U.S. dollars. Um, and that's only for the top 10 percent of individuals. So when you compare that to the GDPs of Spain, South Korea, Australia, and Italy, you can see it's really in the same league. It's interesting. I mean, if you think of there's of the population of India, the top 10 percent. So we're talking about, you know, north of a couple hundred, you know, 100 million people. And that population is at 1.9 trillion in income. Mm -hmm. And then that is basically rivaling Italy and more than Australia, South Korea, and Spain in terms of GDP. I and mean, this is a tremendous, right. it's like a powerhouse within a powerhouse. Is that fair to say? Exactly. So when we look at forecasts for India, um, some forecasts are saying that it could overtake Germany as the third largest economy in the world by 2030. And Germany has their own economic struggles. Right, <laughs> of well course. Documented. Right. Um, so really where that's coming from, a, a large part of that is this really strong domestic demand and consumer sentiment. So if you're a policymaker in India mm -hmm. going to Davos right now, what does this mean to you? I think it can mean two things. First of all, there's really a market for luxury goods. Mm. So we've seen um, brands like Gucci, LVMH and others, you know, really trying to get into India's market. Um, and then also, I think there's a lot of potential here. You know, you have the UK pursuing a trade, a free trade agreement with India um, that they're hoping to finalize soon. So I think it's it's both a domestic powerhouse in itself and then also a market that can open up more globally. Yeah, you can see that. I mean, there have been reports recently as some mm -hmm. of these high-end luxury brands, as you said, trying to move more into the market. And not just the fashion brands, but also we think Tesla, some of the auto right. brands. Everyone is looking at the Indian market. But I think what the data here shows is where this growth in the Indian market mm -hmm. can come from, some of the high-end consumer goods. Now, you mentioned high-end luxury goods. And of course, the first thing I thought about there was China. Because... Mm -hmm. 10, 15 years ago, we were having a very similar conversation about China. Are there parallels here between the Chinese and Indian economy? I think 
There are parallels, but I think in many ways, India has been able to do something that China hasn't been able to do. If you look at just this really strong domestic demand um, and consumer sentiment. Well, that's something the Chinese have tried to do. This right. is a big part of their policy. We want to drive domestic demand. And I think what you're showing in the data here is maybe the Indians are achieving it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, We'll see over time how right. it develops. One question I want to ask you is about inequality, because if you see a chart like this, top 10 percent having this much of national income, of course, the natural question is, therefore, what about the rest of the 90 percent? Right. So if we look at the Gini coefficient, which assesses inequality around the world, what it really shows is that India is on par with all of these countries and is actually slightly more equal than the U.S., hmm. um, which maybe is surprising to some. I will caveat this, though, by saying that one of the things that would really propel the Indian economy further is expanding its labor force participation, translation, women's labor force participation. So I think as we're looking you know, to 2030, um, that's really one of those indicators that I'm going to be watching. Great. Well, we'll continue to track it here at the Geoeconomic Center. Sophia, thanks so much for looking into it for us. Mm -hmm. For Under the Radar this week, we wanted to look at Bangladesh. I'm pleased to welcome Imu Gonk Bursari, Assistant Director at the Geoeconomic Center. Gonk, what happened in Bangladesh over the past few weeks? Josh, it's an action-packed year for elections this year, and the first election of the year was in Bangladesh on earlier this month, and Sheikh Hasina won a fourth straight term in fourth Bangladesh term, this wow. year. Yeah. But it's not quite so simple. It isn't. No election is, and this one, as all is very complicated because the opposition boycotted the elections because they thought that they would not have the requisite space to make their case for uh, for votes. And so the opposition boycotted the US and the UK, in fact, said post-elections that these elections were not held in a free and fair way. And um, they've been very critical about, um, about the elections. And at the same time, a senior Bangladeshi official has commented saying that we're not bothered. That's a direct quote. That's quite a line, we're not bothered, when yeah. you hear criticisms from the U.S. and Europe about the integrity of your election, to hear that kind of pushback. You don't hear that very often. That's how Bangladeshi government feels about it, but what about the Bangladeshi citizens? It's not very, uh, it's, it's a lot of the citizens and the industry, the ready-made garment industry especially, is very bothered because 85, it runs 85% of all of Bangladesh's exports. This is a huge it's part a huge of the amount, economy. Most of it going to the U.S. and to Europe. Yeah. And so they're really concerned because, you know, they're, face, they're already facing a series of headwinds. One is that because of high inflation, global demand, especially from the U.S. and Europe, is lower. A lot of the laborers are asking for higher wages. And also, the, Bangladesh is set to lose its least developed country status in 2026, which means it will lose a lot of trade and subsidy duty-free advantages. So on top of that, there, there are more and more risks and uh, rumors about you know, potential U.S.-European sanctions. Well, the graduating from least developed countries is something obviously countries want, but it yeah. does come with a cost. There's less the benefits cost. that are then attached. And they're already talking about it. The finance minister has already been talking about, you know, how do we approach this? Because, of course, when you are, when a lot of your growth has been driven by exports, you want to make sure that you don't just crumble because you lose benefits. And so strength is really important there as well. And so we think of the ready-made garment industry, how critical it is for the Bangladeshi economy. Mm -hmm. The last thing they could afford right now are sanctions. Exactly. But at the same time, you know, th that's how the U.S. and Europe have approached this election. But China, Russia, India mm. have all approached it very differently. In fact, they've all embraced Sheikh Hasina. The Chinese and the Russian ambassadors visited uh, Sheikh Hasina in person to congratulate her. And so we might expect a few more deals, a few more coordination mechanisms that develop between these countries, especially if Sheikh Hasina is more estranged from the West. From the well, West. that's very interesting. So they're not bothered by yeah. the election. They're continuing business as usual yeah. with the Bangladeshi government. And I guess the question then from a U.S. or European perspective is, if you introduce sanctions, you could actually drive the government and the country into more arrangements with China, Russia, etc. Exactly. And it, Bangladesh is also a critical partner for India as well. The Indian government has also embraced she Sheikh Hasina. She's been a long time uh, key ally for the government. And so in a way, you know, if you if you push Bangladesh further to away from the West, you're also in a way pushing it a bit further from India, which is a key partner.
And so there's a lot of different dynamics to balance. It's just so interesting because we take one election in one country, Bangladesh, and it touches on so many geopolitical, geoeconomic issues. China-Russia relationships, sanctions of the West, just one election and their exports in that country implicate and give exactly. showcase all of these dynamics that are playing out. So what should we look for next? We, well, I don't expect anything major, anything major to happen specifically because of the reasons we've talked about, that it's not just that, well, we saw elections that have been kind of fuzzy, and so just impo uh, impose sanctions. I think that's also not how the, the way that U.S. approaches these kinds of issues, yeah. but they have put on some visa restrictions. Mm -hmm. So people that the U.S. believes are directly implicated in uh, the elections and them not being conducted in a fair and free way, they cannot can no longer uh, travel to the U.S., and those kinds of, you know, they're not as significant as financial sanctions, of course. Of course. But there are some, they are sending a signal that we are taking this seriously and we won't just ignore hmm. what has happened. So maybe one thing we can look out for, because we've done things together during the IMF World Bank spring meetings, is who comes from Bangladesh yeah. to Washington in April. We'll keep our eyes on that. Gang, thanks so much for looking into this for us. Mm -hmm. For By the Numbers this week, I want to bring an Associate Director at the Geoeconomic Center, Niels Graham. Niels, what was our big number this week? This week, our big number was 160%. What does it represent? It represents U.S. manufacturing construction spending growth since 2015. So what we're looking at is how much the U.S. has spent in 2023 compared to maybe the last decade or so. Let's take a look at the chart. So walk us through the new data here. Exactly. So what you're looking at here are comparisons of U.S. and EU manufacturing construction spending. We start in uh, 2015, um, and what we're really seeing is the surging U.S. manufacturing spending. You know, U.S. manufacturing spending is over 160% what it was in uh, 2015. EU is barely over 10%. And what this really represents is the massive amount of legislation the U.S. has put in place over the past two issues. And so let's go through the individual spikes here. First, in January 2021, you see the increase starting. What's driving that? Exactly. So this has been driven by two main factors. The first of which is a piece of legislation we don't have on the chart, but it's the Infrastructure and Jobs Act that was yeah. passed in the kind of summer of 21. This is the beginning of the Biden administration. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So th this was a lot more tw geared towards public center infrastructure spending, but this captured some of the BMW manufacturing spending as well. But what you're also seeing is a reaction to kind of COVID and a lot of the issues that uh, manufacturing especially felt during COVID. And then we get the big jump here. Here's, I mean, a surge that you just don't typically see in a short time frame. And what's driving this? Exactly. So we have these two massive pieces of legislation that were put in place summer of 2022. We have the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, IRA, and the CHIPS Act, which really focused on U.S. semiconductor manufacturing spending in particular. And what you're seeing here is the U.S. putting in massive amounts of financial firepower, north of a trillion dollars, around 1.3 to 1.6 trillion dollars worth of new incentives to build production here in the United States. And private sector firms responding to the stresses that we saw during COVID, really taking advantage of that funding and really putting it in place as soon as they had access to it. And this is all kinds of manufacturing. There's chips, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of green energy transition manufacturing that's a part of it. What other sectors are impacted? It, it, exactly. You know, this is across the board, but really zeroing in on electronics manufacturing, electrical ma um, engineering, as well as computers. You know, this is surging four times what it was before COVID. And again, really in response to a lot of the chip shortages we saw during COVID, but also the really specific government funding. So this is going back to the CHIPS Act, which is focused on reshoring U.S. Uh, chips production as both a security risk as well as a supply chain risk. This chart is so interesting to me because I can't remember in recent times where you see such a direct mm -hmm. policy transmission of legislation to spending. I was in the White House during the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. That was the response to the global financial crisis. We can go back. The data is not here, but it did not have this kind of surge, even though many policymakers wanted it to. Why is this working? Exactly. You know, this is supply side economics in action. It's really working because it's an alignment of private sector incentives, particularly around the stresses that they saw during, well, in their own supply chains during COVID, as well as just the government putting a massive amount of very easily accessible money in their pockets to really spend on construction and manufacturing. So it's a really alignment of both government interests yeah. and private sector interests. So the private sector wants to do it, the government's supporting it, exactly. but we have to look at the comparison here on this chart, mm -hmm. the EU. Exactly. So we really pick the EU comparison with the US because both countries or both organizations are really talking about this in the same rhetoric. You know, the EU is saying the same sort of things the US is in terms of reshoring uh, manufacturing, particularly for the Green Revolution within its own borders. However, the main difference is the US is the financial higher power to do it. The EU really does not. The EU spending has really paled in comparison, and it shows in the chart. 
Yeah, I mean, it's just when you think about what the EU is saying, they're talking about green energy transition, all these same things. The money is just not there. I mean, part of this just has to do, there's no central fiscal capacity in the EU. And the U.S., for all its fiscal issues, obviously has been able, at least in this front, to coordinate. Exactly. So I think the real thing to watch is, you know, this manufacturing is going to eventually come into factories on the ground. The U.S. is going to be able to produce now at a scale that it was not able to before. The EU is just going to be playing catch up. So whether it's relying on U.S. imports or Chinese imports would be the real question. Because it's clearly not being able to produce it domestically within its own borders, at least in the initial run. There was so much concern when the IRA was passed from the Europeans. We heard about it a lot at the Atlantic Council. And that their concern was competitiveness. And I think if you look at this chart, you understand why they were so concerned about the legislation. They could foresee what was coming. Exactly. And going one step further, you know, it's EU companies as well trying to take advantage of this. Yeah. We're seeing EU firms base production in the United States to take advantage of IRA incentives. And this is, again, just drawing additional yeah. IRA from Brussels, from the Commission, who wants those factories to be built within their own borders. And they just haven't been able to compete at the level of subsidies mm -hmm. and investments. So what should we expect going forward when we do this chart in 24, 25, 26, new data? Sure, so going forward, I think we're gonna see, we have already seen a sort of bottoming out. We'll continue to see more production being put in place, but I think the real important thing to watch is whether or not these new factories, these new things being built right now are actually going to be utilized. Mm -hmm. Is the U.S. going to have the labor force willing to support this manufacturing construction boom? Is the U.S. willing to integrate into global supply chains in a cost competitive way such that, you know, we don't have a ton of new capacity come online, but immediately you run into utilization issues where no one is really buying those goods because either they're too expensive or we don't have the skills to produce them well. One thing that you pointed out that I think is so critical of this chart, this is construction spending on exactly. manufacturing. It's not the manufacturing itself. Exactly. You know, the, the end goal for the U.S. is really producing these goods within its own borders. Half of this is building the factory, but the other half, again, is staffing, yeah. is really making sure that we have the consumers in place to buy them and they have, uh, or they're just cost competitive on the global advantage. Yeah. You know, one thing we don't put on this chart is China. They're producing at massive scales as well, whether or not the U.S. is able to respond to yeah. these influx of Chinese goods would be another big question. And you've well. seen examples of this. TSMC and others have said, we're not sure we can be profitable given labor costs, et cetera, in the U.S. So that will be the test in the years to come. I think this is one of the most important issues for the U.S. economy, certainly headed into an election here, mm -hmm. here in the U.S., but also for the global economy. So we'll continue to watch it in the years ahead. Niels, thank you so much. Thank you. That's it for this week's Guide to the Global Economy. If you like this video, subscribe to our newsletter. It comes out on Sunday nights. You can also like the video, subscribe to our channel, follow all the content and research coming out from the Geoeconomic Center. Hope everyone has a great rest of the week.